Well, thank you everyone so much for joining me today with my interview of Mr. Eustace Wolfington, who is the executive producer behind the new movie Cabrini. Uh, sir, if uh, I would love for the listeners for you to tell uh, just a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in uh, bringing uh, the mo this movie about this uh, uh, famous uh, Catholic saint and uh, hero uh, to life. Yeah, well, uh, it's a very in 1965, when I was 23 years of age, <clears throat> I had to find a church near my office where I could find a 630 mass. I lived too far out of, out, of, out of the city. I found this church. I had, had been, you know, 12 years of Catholic education. I saw the statue of a woman. I had no idea who it was. The priest said we're going to do a nine-week novena of Mother Cabrini. I'd never, ever heard her name before. I went to the novena. I kind of... I started doing homework on her. And I, I made her my role model, my patron saint. Um, now, because she was a great entrepreneur, uh, as well as a great uh, humanitarian. 60 years later, a nun walked to my office and said, will you help me do a movie on Mother Cabrini? I said, sister, absolutely not. I said, I did one movie, Bella. I don't ever want her to do another movie again. I said, uh, I'm very sorry. I just can't do it. She bugged me for six years. Finally, in the seventh year, she invited me up to New York to the Cabrini Shrine to introduce me to an Italian film company. They were going to do the movie. And it was a very good film company. I looked at what they were going to do. I said, no, you cannot do that to Cabrini. We have to do a Gandhi movie. He was a Hindu. It didn't get in the way. She said, no, it can't get in the way. We have to do a movie of a woman a powerful woman, great humanitarian, that the whole world will be open to. No one will feel it being preached to or it being blocked out. Whether you're a Hindu or you're a Muslim, whatever you are, you're going to come to this where we learn about Cabrini and let her life be the sermon and come in the back door. Because once you learn about her, you're going to start looking her up and reading about her. And that's a much better way to come in. Um, I said, but two conditions. You won't interfere with me. And the, and the second condition is that I'm going to make it a charity, a 5013C. So nobody will make any money on this movie. That was it. We started the movie. We spent, I got. I had to look, find a writer. We had no script. Um, although, interesting side, side note here. Um, Scorsese was going to do a movie on Mother Company in 1973. Sophie Loren was going to a movie on Mother Cabrini in 1950. For some reason, they never got done. In fact, I had written Scorsese to see if I could buy the script that he had completed, but he didn't, he didn't have it. But he gave me a tip. Uh, Scorsese's tip was get an Italian actress. Hmm. And, and we weren't looking for an Italian actress uh, to play Mother Cabrini. And of course, that was the best tip anyone could ever have given us uh, because one of the things we did in this film, we made Mother Cabrini the executive executive producer. This had an impact on our cast, on the crew, on the unions, on all the extras. We had 1,200 extras. Everyone was on fire for Mother Cabrini when this film was shot. Um, and we really feel that in many ways she did inspire this film. You have to remember, Mother Cabrini is probably, she's the first American saint. I didn't know that when I first met her. 90% of the people I talk to today don't know that. I had never heard of her. She's a woman who's forgotten uh, only because at her time there was no radio, no TV, no press. One thing that tells you what Mother Cabrini was, when she was canonized, on July the 7th in 1946, a woman went to that canonization. The woman left that canonization and on August the 18th of 19, the woman went and resigned from her order. This woman, like Mother Cabrini, was a school teacher. 
She said, I'm going to model my life on Mother Cabrini. That was Mother Teresa. Wow. And they both had the same background. But Mother Teresa lived in a time when you had a lot of publicity. Cabrini lived in a time when all you had was newspapers. Uh, she had to travel by boat or by, at the, at the time, there were no, there were no cars. Uh, she had no airplanes. She went, went up back and forth. She went by ship. And with all that, this woman, in 67 years, uh, pardon me, in, 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 in 22 years, developed 67 institutions around the world. That's and incredible. everyone ran like everyone ran like a clock. And she did not she did not come to America until she was 39 years of age. She was a school teacher in Italy. She opened schools, she opened orphanages, but she was right, stayed local in, in, in the Italy. In fact, when you look at the movie and you see when she goes to the uh Rome for the first time, they turn her down because all the bishops in Italy got together and said, we don't want to lose her. So they called Rome and said, wow. yeah, she's going to ask permission to go to China. We don't want to lose her. So they turned her down. Uh, but as you know from seeing the movie, she was a very gutsy lady. Yeah. And, and when she wanted to do something, nobody turned her down. <laughs> the one thing she had to dodge all her life if any bishop had said to her at any time, this is an order, you must stay here in Italy. She would have done it. And she knew that she knew that, that bullet could come any time. And she was really great, really adept at dodging it. I mean, if, if someone's handicapped and they come to this movie, they walk out with hope. Uh, if, if people have problems, I don't care what their problems are, they come to this movie in fact, we have many letters saying how, how upset people were, are with the conditions in the world today. It's a broken world. But they come into our movie and they walk out excited and on fire for life again. Uh, it's amazing the transformational effect this movie's having on people. That's really you know, great. In every generation, you know, in every generation, there's a movie that somehow comes along at the right time. Scorsese never got it done. Sophie Loren never got it done. I truly believe God let it be done this time because we need it this time. I mean, her story is, is making people uh, want to go out and do things better, speak up. Uh, it's just amazing. We, we have probably, I don't know, Jason, how many testimonials? What we did after, after each screening, probably even where you were, we had cameras outside and we said to anybody, if you want to give a testimony, give it because it's, it's, it's a spontaneous response to what they just saw. And, you know, they can't make it up. They just got to tell what their feelings were. And we have unbelievable recordings from young, as, as young as eight years old, 102 years old, male, female, every ethnic group, uh, atheists, uh, you know, Hindus, Mother Cabrini, her life, and watching her in action really inspires these people. And they all love the fact that, that we didn't preach. They come out and they say that. They say, we came into the movie expecting to get somebody laying some doctrine on us, laying this on us. We were so pleased that we walked in and had a movie about a person without somebody trying to give us an agenda. So it's really, there's a lot there. I think it's really fascinating. And one of the things that I mean, you've, you brought up a lot of points, like again, the fact that, you know, you're focusing on the, per, trying to focus on the person rather than preaching spirituality. You're uh, trying to, or, or religious dogma. You're talking about, I mean, I think it's just fascinating that, you know, a movie about, um, you know, a nun that, you know, just kind of keeps pushing in order so that she can, you know, pass all the humanitarian causes she wants to do and who, you know, is, is fighting, you know, for to make orphanages and to improve people's conditions in life, you know, against, you know, 
uh, racism and sexism and all those things that are portrayed in the movie. I think it's really funny that that started your journey by <laughs> by a sister coming and just bugging you until you got involved mm. in the movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, I never thought of that. I never thought of that. But it's the same thing. You're right. But uh, but I will say this. So one of the, the interesting things about this is I think it's fascinating because I didn't realize this that you had worked on Bella, which was, you know, an early, early movie by, uh, by the same director. Uh, uh, what was it? His name is Alejandro Monteverde. He did yeah, exactly. that film. And then of course he's most famous for having done the movie Sound of Freedom. I assume that you guys were working on this project together before that movie blew up. Um, but uh, what, what was the decision for having him be the director of this film? Was it the fact that you had worked together before or were there, what was, what was it made that made him right to direct this project? That's a great question. Uh, <clears throat> I did not start out. I, I had heard that Alejandro was working on another project and was not going to be available. So I, I, I accepted that because the people who told me that were his, uh, were Leo Sorvino and, and Rod Barr, the writer, who worked with him very closely. Uh, I'm in church one day at an 8 o'clock mass on a Sunday morning, and I get this overwhelming uh, impulse uh, to go call Alejandro. I walk back to my house at 10 o'clock, and nobody calls me on a Sunday morning. I get this phone call. We have to get Alejandro. And that was my sign. I had I started talking to Sofia Coppola. Uh, I we we thinking she was a woman. It was an Italian movie, It'd be perfect. Uh, but I had this impulse. The fact that I had worked with Alejandro made it something I, I always wanted. Uh, because it makes it makes a big difference to know the way the person thinks uh, who's making the film, especially a film like. And uh, it just turned out the decision. But it was it was it was inspired. It wasn't anything I came up with. And when Alejandro read the script, you know, he said he said there's certain movies you you're uh, you want to make, and there's certain movies you're called to make. He said uh, he felt that this was a film he was called to make because he didn't wow. want to do a movie about a nun. He figured doing a movie about a nun is the best way in Hollywood to go to the bottom of the barrel. Hmm. And so he was not anxious to do a movie about a nun. But once he learned about Cabrini and got to know her, uh, he was on fire for her. In fact, uh, she has, all through the film, he said that he shot shots in this film that he does not remember shooting. Hmm. Uh, he, he was, and, and the actress, the actress, um, Christiana Delano, had never been in America before. Uh, she came from right outside of Rome. She studied in London for 10 years. So she had beautiful English and beautiful diction. Um, and she, the film she did before this she was the lead mob doll in Gamora, which is a, a, a series on Netflix about the Italian mafia in Italy. And she went from that to Cabrini. That's and she amazing. Really, and she really got into it. I'll tell you, she really. Got into how, it. how 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 did you how did you end up picking her? Well, our our casting director called us and said, "I found a woman. I put all my money on her." Wow. And uh, and uh, we had an interview her by Zoom because. This COVID was going on, and people right. just weren't allowed, allowed in the country. Uh, but we knew right away that she was our girl. And she's, and as you saw the movie, I don't think like she's outstanding in the way she portrays Cabrini. Yeah. What was what when was you, about her that that jumped out to you about her portrayal of Cabrini that stood out over the others? Just her. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so the. The, the one thing that has gotten some pushback from some Catholic people and Catholic sources about this movie that I've seen has been that there is a feeling that you've brought this up a couple of times, which is, I think, why it's interesting to talk about, is that um, her 
her faith seems to be a de-emphasized aspect of her character. We talk about it a lot. There's spends a lot of time with, you know, Mother Cabrini, the humanitarian, Mother Cabrini, you know, the, the advocate, activist, and uh, Mother Cabrini, you know, the, you know, anti-racist and the feminist, you know, all these different things. But there's, but while there are, you know, moments, you know, that, and she's obviously a nun and she works in the Catholic community, there isn't a lot where her relationship with God is explored. And I know that one of the things that, you know, and how that motivates her, how that's a part of just her as a part of her life. And I know that you didn't want it to be something that preached to people. You didn't want it to be something that, um, that's, uh, you know, alienated people. But there is a sort of sense among many people, religious people, that people who are religious can only be elevated if their the faith aspect of them is flattened or kind of watered down. And so as a, as a strong Catholic yourself, I was wondering what would be, what would be the thing that you would say to those people to push back on that concern or that critique of this film? Well, you know, it's funny. I have a poem that I have uh, superimposed on her picture, which I frame and give to people. It says, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any time. Hmm. By a good guess. And St. Francis said, I'm gonna, when, when he gave a sermon, sometimes I'll use words. Hmm. I, I think the depth of Mother Cabrini's faith, you, to, to imagine, when you look at all the saints, like the, the little flower was, the little flower was my picture saying, still is, uh, before Mother Cabrini. And someone did a movie on the little flower. And I couldn't wait to see it. When I saw it, I was so disappointed. It was a fairy tale movie. And I said, I'm not going to do a fairy tale movie, Uncle Bernie. Hmm. She, went, she, she was out there. This woman, if you, first of all, her faith shines through in everything she does. I mean, was, you, you, you know, know what's driving her. Um, uh, her, her works speak for themselves. And our whole idea was that she was the sermon. She was hmm. the sermon. And, and, you know, everyone knows she's praying. Everyone knows uh, she has a relationship with God. I mean, but she's in the world doing God's work. And there's a, there's a lot of people in the world that spend a lot of time praying, but not doing God's work. And, hmm. um, and she, she's doing God's work. That's the best prayer there is. Hmm. So I, I, I think, um, I definitely think we made the right move on that. Well, the one, one last thing is to kind of wrap up uh, the interview. Um, what would, I guess I would say, throw it to you. Of the, besides the things we've talked about already, if there's one thing that you would want people to take away from this movie, um, what what is it that you're hoping for? Uh, one, that they recognize Mother Cabrini's vision was eternity. Hmm. Uh, there's a line in the movie that says, we have plenty of time to rest in heaven. <laughs> and because that was her vision, she never let anything get in her way because she saw beyond what other people saw. Um, her, well, to all her nuns were, the biggest thing she taught them was humility. Hmm. Uh, they had a, and they had to humble themselves. Her nuns came from Northern Italy. The immigrants were from Southern Italy. And there was a big difference in and the cultural background sure. and education. Uh, so when they, they were, these nuns were shocked when they came here, but they mm. just got it. They all got, they all became Mother Teresa's overnight. And, um, you know, she worked in prisons. We, we, we couldn't even begin to show the stuff she did. We got, people say the movie's too long now at two hours and eight minutes. And, uh, and, and we couldn't begin to touch on what this woman did. Couldn't begin. Um, uh, I mean, you could do a series. They could do a a series of uh, forty seasons. Because you could do fifteen seasons just on her life in Italy before she came here. Um, an incredible life. But what I'm, what we like people to walk out is that a life. The old saying, "A life not lived for others is a life wasted." And we we just want people to walk out realizing that getting away from the me 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 me. 
and get and go into the uh, give, 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 give for the other person. Uh, spirit will take over, and that is happening. That's, that's, that's definitely happening. There's a transformation taking place with most of the people who come into the film. If any complaint, there is a complaint you brought up, and that's why don't we show more spiritual? Why don't we show more praying? Um, and I hope I explained that, but uh, cool. Well, she is, she is who she is, who she is. And, she, and she did plenty of praying. Her fact, her, her whole a lot of retreats with her nuns or nuns that are well educated. The spiritual exercises of the Jesuit order is what was the back backbone of, of, of all, her, all her retreats. Um, she was a contemplative. She traveled a lot in between all the work she did, and that's when she prayed, and that's when she had a lot of contemplation. Um, but it's just, it's just amazing that a human being who never did more than high school could be that bright and that much of a genius to go out and build buildings, take care of zoning, buy ground, to make business deals. The first thing she did with all her nuns when they walked into a town was make them look for the best lawyer in town and learn contracts. Wow. I mean, she, she, she knew what she had to do. And, uh, and she was, and she, and, and people tried to walk over a couple of times and were shocked. Like when she built the hospital in Chicago, uh, they went to the settlement on the ground. She had walked the ground the night before every inch of that ground. And when she got to the settlement table, they tried to cheat her out of some ground and she picked it right up. Uh, when, 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 when contractors walked out on her, she got all nuns. All right, ladies, go to work. You're going to be a plaster. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. She was a make it happen lady. Nothing got in the way. Make it happen. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. Uh, the movie is Cabrini uh, from Angel Studios and will be in theaters uh, March 8th. Um, uh, thank you again so much, uh, Mr. Eustace Wolfing uh, Wolfington, for joining us today. And uh, if you are interested in the movie, check it out uh, on angelstudios.com and also in theaters March 8th. Okay, no, no, don't say it that way. Say this is a must-see movie. <laughs> <laughs> you, you heard it here first. You heard it here okay. first, folks. <laughs> All right.